Hey, Monica, can you hear me? Um, I can't hear anything. And I don't think Julia can either. I don't know if you're, if class has actually started or not, but. Okay, can you hear us now? Okay, sorry, yeah. So it's my first time sharing the desktop screen, so maybe I couldn't use the regular thing. Okay, so earlier I was talking about, okay, so uh, thank you for those who already filled out the self-introduction over here, as well as some of the data model comments. And I know there are some questions in there, and um, feel free, everybody should feel free to comment and have a discussion. And also the survey, I know um, some of you, not everybody has done it, so please also take some time to do it. And the new thing that I added on Moodle is this uh, project paper list. Um, so for this class, um, there are mainly two options if you want to do the project. Either you do a data analysis using a Bayesian methods that we learned, or you can choose um, individually or as a pair, as a pair to find um, a research paper to read and understand the material. Simulation studies based on what they provide and maybe some of the derivations of the group that they have. And you can also do some application based on that. Um, so I start to grow this paper list that you can choose from. So I started this um, uh, section in Moodle and actually trying to get it uh, as we progress through different chapters. So you notice that the five, the four over here, mostly based on uh, chapter two. Uh, like the one parameter model and what we are talking about today, multi column approximation. So those are the papers related um, to those. So as the semester goes on, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to grow this list as well. So over here, overall, um, I say so like over here, the first paper is that, like the title, where it is published, as well as some very short comments about what that paper is. And then I will have a lit, like it, all of the PDFs attached over here. Okay, so maybe like if you, I'm not sure what exactly the project that I want to do. Maybe this will be another um, sort of uh, resources that you can go to. And um, all of this should be very related to what we actually do in class. So maybe like even if you're not trying to do a project out of it, it might still be worth checking them out if you want to learn a little bit more about, uh, about that. So, but also if you have another research paper that you actually want to present, not on the list, that's fine as well, but please check in with me as soon as you can, so I can ver like just to evaluate really briefly to see if that's a suitable project, like a suitable paper to be read. Okay. Um, all right. So that's um, okay. Cool. So that's what I want to share on this, and now I can just get rid of. Okay. Okay, and then I can.
Hey, Monica, we can't hear you again. Um, I think when you switched your computer, maybe a different one is recording or something. Can you hear me? Okay, can you yeah. hear me? Okay, all right, okay. Uh, all right, so sorry about that. So we were talking about Monte Carlo approximation and then I was saying that there was, um, right, so if you have heard the term bootstrap, that's actually an example of uh, Monte Carlo approximation. So maybe you used it before, but you didn't even realize that um, that's um, Monte Carlo approximation. So for bootstrap, uh, in intro stats, sometimes we like to um, talk about, say, if you want to make inference about a mean of a population, and then you try to make the inference from a um, sample that you got. Sometimes you have a really small sample, say like only about five observations, and then based on central limit theorem, you know that you need to have a large enough sample to, to use the central limit theorem to use the, a normal approximation. So um, for that kind of situation, people would like to use something called bootstrapping. Meaning that, okay, because uh, the assumption is not uh, assume, uh, like a satisfied, so now I would need to figure out something else. So bootstrapping meaning that instead of just using the five observations in my sample, I'm actually gonna generate uh, samples of size five multiple, multiple times from what I have from the original sample. And then I can construct a bootstrap sampling distribution from there in order to make the, like an inference about the mean. So bootstrapping meaning that you're really just putting yourself uh, meaning that, um, okay, I, I don't have much more resources, but this based on certain theory um, that is doable, so I would do that instead of using the general central limit theorem, which is not usable in this case. So um, in general, Monte Carlo approximation is trying to um, figure out a way, instead of doing analytic solution, there are a lot of times. So first of all, analytic solution might not be available for all of the cases. So if that is the case, uh, Monte Carlo approximation usually can be helpful. And a different situation is sometimes even if analytic solution is possible, say you can derive what the posterior distribution is, it will still be very tedious to actually draw from or like to, to, to make inference from that. So instead of knowing what that distribution is, you can make draws from that distribution and then summarize from those draws in order to say if you want to uh, do inference about the mean. So this is the general um, background. So let me just um, give you some introduction at the beginning, show you how the procedure is working. And then that can, of course, go beyond, say, on the third bullet point over here, um, theta is the parameter, unknown parameter. In addition to doing like mean variance estimation for the theta, you can also do functions of theta. The example that we're gonna use uh, is the odds ratio which is a very typical um, quantity that people are interested in. If they're um, making inference about say like success, failure, and then I want to know about the odds uh, instead of, in addition to those. And in the end, we're gonna come to the posterior predictive distributions. And that's actually talked a little bit about it last time already. So once we get there, um, we will see how you can actually use multi color approximation uh, other than deriving what the distribution is. All right, so this is um, very um, simple, basic um, kind of theory behind how that should work. So suppose you want to summarize posterior distribution of a function of theta or just theta itself. So here I just try to use the generic, generic case, the function of theta. So for example, if you want to compute the expectation, so because this is posterior, so you're gonna write expectation of theta given y, okay? because now it's given the data. 
So if you want to compute the expectation of that, this is uh, from probability and calculus what you can do, okay? Because now it's expectation, posterior expectation, and in particular, a um, function of g, g theta. So expectation of that will be here, because it's this new phi over here, phi given theta, and you integrate over this. So this is the density, posterior density. This is the random variable itself. So that will be the mean. And then I just rewrite it in terms of um, the theta that we know. Okay, so pay attention here. Um, theta is the random parameter, or no random parameter. And we're working on a function of theta, which is phi, okay? So now the question is getting phi. So that's why even though, so the first part over here is try to just write it out, what this integral is. And the last part is to put it into um, functions of theta because theta was the posterior. So the question, the usual situations where we actually want to use something other than just trying to integrate doing this integral is, what if you cannot do the computation or if you're gonna have multiple parameters? In this case, we like to call it higher dimension parameters. So you not only have just theta, one theta, you're gonna have multiple of them. How are you gonna actually compute the mean? So integration in those cases will be um, very hard to do. And this is the biggest motivation people start to do this Monte, uh, Monte Carlo approximation. Okay, so let's keep in mind right now, we're dealing with the mean, the expectation, okay? And it's expectation of a function of the random parameter. And the parameter, suppose you know what the posterior is. So this is the posterior. Okay, so the situation we're considering now is impossible to compute the whole, uh, integral or if you're gonna have higher dimensions. All right, so the procedure that you can do it is actually um, pretty straightforward. We're actually gonna, instead of doing analytic solution, we're doing simulation. And notice that here, we are having a new letter, capital S over here. And this is telling you the number of draws that you are doing for this Monte Carlo approximation. So we're gonna see what is each draw later, but this capital S is counting the number of draws that we're doing, okay? So suppose we can sample S values of the posterior, from the posterior distribution of theta, and we're doing independent identically over here. So you notice that, so this is the posterior distribution, theta given Y, and we're taking draws out of it. So we're labeling them, using theta one, theta two, until theta s over here, okay? And notice that we're doing independent draws, identical independent draws, because they're all from the same posterior distribution, and we label them as theta one to theta s. So here, we write it just for large s. Later, we're gonna talk about how large is good enough, but for now, just um, keep in mind that we're doing it for capital S number of times, and each of them is uh, IID from the posterior distribution. So multiple, uh, So based on law of large numbers, this two guarantees why we can use these draws in order to approximate what the mean is. Okay, so the first one is only just about the theta. And the second one is about the mean of G theta, okay, which is phi that we're curious about earlier. So these two lines we're actually talking about, okay, if I can have a large number of draws, theta one until theta s, and if I take the sample mean of all of the thetas, the sample mean by law of large numbers can approximate the actual expectation, okay? And that applies to a function of theta as well. So what that means is, so look at this form. It's actually pretty interesting. So what we're drawing, notice here, we are drawing thetas, okay? So this is telling us, okay, instead of theta itself, I'm curious about a function of theta, which is g theta. I can still just draw thetas first, and then I can apply this function g theta, and then I will just summarize based on that, okay? 
So the first row is talking about, okay, I just got theta, so I just take the sample mean that will approximate the expectation. If I'm curious about function of theta, I will still draw a set of like S, capital S number of small uh, thetas, and then I would just use the G function, apply the G function on top of that, and then take the mean, the sample mean will also give me um, the expectation of the function of that, okay? So in short, sample means converge to their expectations based on law of large numbers, okay? But notice that very importantly, when we're doing this law of large numbers, all of the draws are IID, okay? So that's why we have the biggest assumption to start with. It is identically independently from the posterior distribution, okay? So um, this is um, the basic and some of the things that we can actually use or utilize um, to make inference about things that we're curious about. So earlier, this is what we have, and we get capital S draws of theta. Okay, so this is what we had um, earlier. So not only just me, many other quantities that you might be interested in, Monte Carlo approximation will work as well. So earlier, the two rows that I show is for the means. Sample means can converge to the expectation if capital S is large enough. So in addition to that, you can do many other things. So the few bullet points over here is just trying to uh, give you a list, an incomplete list of what you can do. So first of all, the empirical CDF. CDF is the cumulative density function. Okay, you're, instead of looking just one point, you're looking at uh, the density up until that point. So capital F is, CDF itself, and then we can actually use empirical CDF to approximate that. So what this means is, this is density, oh sorry, not Y, give me a second. Yeah. So this equals to by definition, equals to that, and it will approximately be the empirical CDF as well. So down here, this is the total number of draws. So earlier we we're saying that we're gonna have a really large number of S, okay? So we're just gonna draw so many of them. On the top, you just need to count. So, so this is CDF cutting off at a certain point, like constant C. So in order to get um, approximation for the CDF, you can use the empirical CDF, meaning that I'm gonna count how many draws I actually get is smaller than that particular constant. And that ratio, the count, the ratio of the count with the total number of draws is going to give me an empirical CDF, which is a probability. Okay, so it's cumulative until that point. So this is um, CDF. How you can do that? Um, you can also let me see. Also, like moments, quantiles, and functions. All of the sample ones are going to actually approximate the true as well. So moments, earlier we talked about the first two moments, right? Uh, the first moment to the mean. And for variance, you can do that approximation as well. And functions, you can do that as well. So um, later we're gonna talk about this Oz ratio, and that will be a function of uh, success probability. And then that will be an example that we're gonna use as how you can um, actually approximate the true functions using a sample function. Okay, so just for example, okay, so this is the other one. And uh, for example here, if you want to compute the proportional events that the function of the theta, any i, larger than the constant, it will just be the same as, like not the same, sorry, that will just be the way that you can approximate a particular event, which is a proportion sample, of proportion of samples where that is true. Okay, so this actually, I think, is an example for the quantiles as well. Okay. So in short, um, the procedure is straightforward, and theory guarantees us to extend, in addition to mean, you can actually make inference for many other functions as well. And this actually extends to higher dimension parameters too. So um, here at the beginning, I just want to give you an overview of what you can do, and then later we're gonna see with different examples in each uh, situation, what you can do. Okay. All right, so, 
Okay, so remember this television example that we uh, talked about at the, I guess, second lecture over here? So we were doing uh, Bayesian analysis using a uniform. Okay, so uniform zero to one, and that's the same as the beta one one. Okay, so just a quick review. Back then, we we're trying to make the inference of the probability of teenagers having a TV in their room. So we were interested in the success probability theta. We put it as a beta prior, okay? And the data is a binomial model, okay? And, and theta. And then we're gonna make inference about theta y, okay? Which is a beta distribution. Okay? And with its new um, two parameters, hyperparameters over there. And we learned this to be, to be conjugate. All right, so this is following what we did before. Okay, so I'm, now I want to show you. So what we had done before is doing the analytic solution. Because it's conjugate. You start with the beta prior, you combine with the binomial model, you come up with a beta posterior. And because we know about this beta distribution, you can actually summarize this directly from that beta distribution, which is the analytic solution. Okay, so remember like back then, the exact posterior mean, we know that because it's a new beta distribution with 693 and 357 as the two um, new A and Bs. We know that the exact posterior mean would just be the ratio of A over A plus B. So we know that the mean, based on the analytic solution, we know it is a beta distribution, should be at about 0.66. And also, if you want to get a 95% central interval, you can use the quantile distribution, remember? We use Q beta and then just return the middle 95%, okay? So before we move on, I just want to highlight all of this uh, analytic solution. We call it analytical solution, meaning that we know exactly what the distribution is. We know exactly it's a beta posterior, and then I can get it exact, say like the exact posterior mean, the exact posterior variance, and also the exact 95% central credible Okay, because I know what the distribution is. So what we're talking about earlier about the uh, Monte Carlo, Carlo approximation is, okay, instead of just doing the analytic solution, I can try to make many draws from the beta distribution. And if I summarize, say if I'm interested in the mean, if I take capital S number of draws from the posterior, if I take the sample mean, it should approximate to this point 66. Okay, and also, if I take so many draws and that use the quantile again, I should also get something very similar to this, okay? So let's see if that can be verified because that's what I was talking to you earlier about what Monte Carlo approximation can be used for. So, okay. If you try to do the simulation base, so I'll provide some R code over here. So you notice that instead of using Q or D, we start to use this R. So I know some of you know about um, this little R over here, and we talked about, okay, so for beta distribution, we said that you can do D beta in R. This is D beta for density, Q beta for quantile, P beta for probability, and then R beta, this R is bend and draws. So this will be something we're gonna use very often in this class, okay? So this R stands for random drops. And then if you do R beta, you are telling R, first of all, how many drops that you want. So this will be our capital S, okay? And this will be the two hyperparameters for the beta, okay? I know many of you already did something related. So I think um, for homework one, like the last question, because the question was asking, suppose you have a thousand draws from this and that, and then what you're gonna expect. Uh, some of you didn't do the draws, which is fine, because from the PDF, you can already tell which one has more extreme values. But I noticed that some of you actually went to use this R function, but at that time, is used R norm, right? And also R logis, because these are the two distributions that we want to compare it to. So, that's the same idea, okay? So in R, uh, I mean, in the software R, uh, people have written packages that can make random draws from a lot of known distributions already. So this is what we're utilizing. 
And our norm is taking random draws of normal distribution and our logis is taking random draws of log logistic distribution. So here we're doing our beta, okay? All right, so in this example, uh, in the demonstration, I did a thousand draws from this beta distribution. And these are the two hyperparameters. Okay, so I'm summarizing the sample mean, 0.660143, uh, pretty close, as you can see, um, to the exact, exact posterior. I also returned the median. Uh, I guess I forgot to return the median over here, so it'd be interesting to go back to verify what that it will be. And here, notice I'm using the quantile function, okay? So this quantile, so this Q back then stands for quantile, okay? But you're getting it from an exact distribution beta, so you use Q beta, and then fit in what are the quantiles that you want, and then what are the hyperparameters. And down here, you're using the quantile function, you fit in what is the vector they're working on, and you tell what are the cut points that you want. Mm -hmm. Good point, yeah. So this slide is trying to kind of like verify and um, make sure that you can be convinced that, okay, in this case, we do know the two hyperparameters of beta, so we can actually get them analytically, and that will be the solution, right? Uh, but for Monte Carlo approximation, uh, the methods that I was talking about earlier is, okay, instead of knowing, so in this case, you know exactly what they are. But if you just draw so many draws, you can see that the sample mean can approximate the true mean very closely, like in this case, converge it very closely, and also for the quantile and for many other functions as well. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good point, good point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, good point. Okay, so here for the television example, we know that the exact posterior will be this distribution, right? So in the past, we have learned about how to like use the formula to compute the mean and use Q beta to compute the quantile, right? So here, this is an example of, okay, if you do simulation, you can see something very close. And Katie's question is, um, is there any situations that you actually don't know exactly what the posterior is? and then how you're gonna do um, the approximation, right? Very good question. So uh, this will just be like, um, so we will talk more about all of the bigger picture later, but for now, maybe let me just give you some example of later why we cannot do it. And um, this hopefully can give you um, some idea that why later we're doing this particular amount of call approximation. So for example, here, we're doing beta. And we know exactly what the beta distribution is. So I think it's, do you guys remember A plus? I forgot that those parameters. Oh. N minus Y plus B minus, something like that. I forgot this one. Um, but this will be the case that you know the exact posterior. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay, so this is about theta, right? The success probability. Okay, so later you will see that in the same lecture, we're gonna talk about something called odds ratio. Okay, so theta is success probability. In a lot of situations, people are interested in addition to the success probability, which is the unknown parameter, they want to know something called odds ratio, which is, you see it's a ratio, it's gonna be the ratio of success probably over the ratio of failure probabilities, okay? So this is a function of theta, right? In particular, if we keep using the notation that we used before, we'll be g theta. And okay? this will be the new C that we were talking about earlier, okay? Uh, yeah, so this will be a much harder problem to do, right? So we know this is a beta, theta is a beta, and you know you can do transformation of variable, and then you use the Jacobian like the exercise that we did before, and then in a lot of cases, you might not be able to get exact distribution. Say in this case, you don't know the distribution of B. So instead of, okay, trying really hard to find the analytic solution, I will actually draw a bunch of phi, oh, sorry, I'll draw a bunch of thetas, and they're gonna compute each phi from each of the phi, uh, each phi from each of the theta, then I should be able to summarize over there, okay? So good point. So you'll see that later with the concrete example, um, but Katie's question here is, okay, why do you care about Multi-color 
information uh, if we actually know exactly what the distribution is. So the quick answer is a lot of times we don't know the posterior distribution for a lot of different functions. So that will be one reason why you want to do it. And for now, uh, I'm trying to use the example, the television example to show you that for the cases that we know, we can still like, you know, the posterior distribution so you can sample from the posterior and then verify that multi polypoxy works. Also, that we, know, mm -hmm. we don't know posterior, then what would you use for A and B in the data? Mm -hmm. Good point, yeah, so right now. Um, okay, so that goes beyond this particular chapter, so later. You know, uh, maybe some of you heard the term like MCMC, which is multi polar approximation. That's the typical computing methods for Bayesian like analysis. So over there, as you can tell from the name, is not just multi It's not just multi polar It's Markov chain. And if you have taken some kind of stochastic process courses or have heard the term before, you'll notice that for Markov chain, is the draws are not independent anymore. So multi polar is independent. Right, that what we have did, or like what we have done before, they're all IID. But later, uh, in order to facilitate the inference for Bayesian methods, we're going to move to something called Markov chain multi -polos. So that Markov chain, so two parts, right? multi is still multi -polo. These are the approximation that we're doing. Markov chain over there is okay. If you instead have instead of just having one parameters, let's just use the normal case, like the normal mu mm -hmm. and sigma square. Suppose both of these are unknown, and if you want to make inference about both, you're gonna put like different priors for two parameters. And then when you try to come up with the computation methods, you will notice that when you try to draw from them, you don't know the distribution of mu and sigma square separately because they're just too complicated together. But you might be able to, you actually are able to know what is the distribution of mu given theta uh, uh, sorry, mu given sigma square and sigma square given mu. So over there, you're going to do iterative sampling. Okay, and that's what the Markov chain is about. So we will see more over there, but that would just be an example where, okay, we actually don't know exactly what the posterior distribution is, but we can approximate it. But that's not just multi color approximation. It's one step further. We actually have to utilize the relationship between the Particular, uh, particular parameters and over there that approximation can work and that's where um, you don't have the exact posterior and you're going to use something related to Monte Carlo approximation. Okay yeah so we're actually going to see it pretty soon in next chapter so let's um, yeah so for now um, maybe just keep in mind so first of all for beta for this uh, television example we know that the theta can be a beta we know the posterior so for this one, we don't even need to do multi polar approximation. But if you're interested in all's ratio, so that's not just uh, the inference about the success probability, it's the ratio of the success probability over the failure probability that becomes a function of theta. And then that will be sometimes where multi polar approximation can be helpful. And then another good point to keep in mind over here is that later, most of later, the models that we learn most of them won't have the exact posterior distribution for each of the parameters that you're interested in. So over there, we're gonna use some kind of approximation. But we need the foundation of the Monte Carlo for now because later ones are building upon this. Okay, okay. make sense? All right, uh, good question. Okay, so down here, um, I just wrote it down. Uh, the capture S determines the accuracy. Maybe um, intuitively makes sense that the larger the number of samples that you make, the closer you will um, approach or converge to um, the actual or the true mean or variance or et cetera, et cetera. So uh, make it larger when practical. So here, when we say practical, for the simple cases, like 10,000, 100,000, we're still pretty, like, run pretty quickly. But if it's some more complicated situations, uh, making larger S might uh, result in, like, too much computation burden. So that's when we say about practical. So maybe at that point, you need to balance like how long you actually want the program to run um, and then uh, balance that between how accurate you want. So usually like a thousand is good and sometimes you want to make it larger, sometimes you want to make it smaller, it depends on the situation, but we're gonna see um, examples of that as well. Okay, so over here I drew a thousand, uh, 10,000 uh, 10, draws and you see that they're pretty close to the analytic solutions over here, okay, those ones. All right. Okay. 
So now let's move to the function of theta. And I think I'm using the um, odds ratio example, which we just talked about a little bit earlier as well. Um, okay, so odds ratio, earlier I was talking about is the success probability over the failure. Some fields really like talk about real like talking about odds ratio instead of just the success um, probability. Uh, so let me just write it down here over here. Mm -hmm. So this becomes a function of theta. Okay. So by doing the usual thing that we did before, you're gonna compute like the inverse function, right? You're gonna come up with the inverse function and then try to do try to do transformation of variable, and that might be very tedious to do. Um, so if you actually want to do it, I just did the derivation for you, and this will actually be the posterior of the odds ratio. Okay. So here is transformation of variables. We did a quick review at the beginning. Transformation of variables. So if you go to uh, the first chapter, the slice, there's um, an example over there. Okay. So this is application of that particular theorem. And you see that you're gonna arrive at some function that is not recognizable. We don't know what a distribution this will be. Um, so instead, we can do multipolar approximation, meaning that we can draw independent samples from the posterior. Okay. So you do that. So realize this is what we did before. So this is still drawing theta. So two steps. Let me break it down. This is drawing thetas. Step one, and step two is based on the theta that you draw, you can get the odds ratio, and then you can um, get, so here you got a thousand draws, a uh, 10,000 draws of thetas, so that means here I get 10,000 draws of odds ratio. And then from there, I can summarize the mean, I can summarize the variance, I can use the quantile function, et cetera, et cetera. So over there, um, I can do inference about odds ratio using multicolor approximation. Okay? And the guarantee uh, was written a couple of slides earlier. Um, that's how um, if you are using Monte Carlo approximation is not only applicable for the parameter itself, but also functions of the parameters. Okay. All right, so let me show you um, how you can summarize that and how close that approximation is. So over here, I just plot it um, using histogram and then density over here. So the red one, the dashed red one, is to choose density. So maybe let me bring it back really quick. So over here, you see that this is the true density. Okay. So I can still write a function to, to um, plot this. And, uh, but also, so that's what this dash line, red dash line is. Okay. And the black solid line is the kernel density, oh, sorry, density estimation, and that's doing multi color approximation. Okay. So this plot is to trying to show you that, okay, um, how close is the approximation? Okay. So notice that, so I don't know, anybody tried using like density function in R before? Yeah, so how does, like, what, like how does that work and how does that help you say like the difference, I guess, density and the histogram? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you notice that, like the Oz TH over here, it's a thousand different draws, right? Yeah. So if you do histogram, they're gonna give you the bin, but you can also use the density function over here to give you like a rough shape 
density approximation to the histogram that you can have. So, so on the same plot, actually, it's all, all three together. Um, but the most important, um, I guess, the most important approximation you should look at is the uh, dashed red line and um, the black solid line. So the black solid line is the approximation, uh, Monte Carlo approximation um, using the density function. And then the true density is from one slide before what the PDF is. So you see that most of it is pretty good. There are some deviations here and there. And in order to um, maybe make it even better, you might want to choose a larger S and that might help. Okay. All right, so those, yeah, so those kind of codes, um, I just leave it over there in case uh, for you, if you want to, for homework or for a project, if you want to do some kind of comparison, those code, like sample code will be useful as well. All right, uh, so just a little bit more. That's a summary from as a plot, but you can also return the mean, the median, and the quantile over here. One thing I want to uh, make you aware is that if you're doing quantile, okay, please make sure that you know this quantile function. So when you're doing quantile, the middle 95, we call it a central credible interval, okay? And then make sure that you know it is actually invariant to monotone transformation, okay? So earlier we know, okay, there was a few slides before, I guess, but earlier we have returned the quantile. I'm just trying to write our code over here. We return the quantile over here. So this is, 95% central quantile, uh, central credible interval, sorry, credible interval of theta, okay? And now we're trying to get uh, the 95% central credible interval for uh, the odds ratio. If you're doing a monotone transformation, then you can just use the two cutoff points and then just transfer them over there, okay? I make a note over here because remember the other more popular and widely used um, interval that we talked about is HPD, the highest density, uh, probably like highest probability density interval. So that one is scary. Why you cannot use transformation directly? Okay. So we will see the example over there. But for now, if you are doing this quantile and if you're doing a monotone transformation, you can actually just get. The original. So this one is actually from before. And then you can just use the two cutoff points, apply the function, and then get the new two cutoff points for the new function that you want to okay. But later for the HPD intervals, you cannot do that. And then over here, you just need to uh, compute the HPD again. All right, yeah, so this is the HPD. So remember last time, I remember like Tony asked a question of a particular H value that I put in for that. So it turns out, um, I think I just used it, like I didn't realize it's a written, pre written function uh, that I had before. And then um, it is, you can think of it as a tuning parameter to make sure that you can reach the coverage that you want. So based on different distributions or ba based on different hyperparameters, you may want to tune, like play around with this that with that particular parameter to get your desired um, uh, coverage. Um, but for most of the class, I mean the semester, we actually going to use a different, um, just a library like a package that people wrote before. It's called Coda, and over there you can actually use a function called HPD interval directly to get an HPD interval. So, so I think this will be the one that we're going to use uh, mostly for this um, particular course. And the way that you do it is, okay, so you install the package, you load it, and then, so remember earlier, you're going to have this as a thousand, uh, 10,000 draws, remember, that you're going to have. So in order to use this Coda package, you're going to ask R to convert. So you see that course the vector into an MC, MC, MC pro, uh, object. So the way to do it is to apply as dot MCMC MC and then the vector that you had before 
you just name it as something different like theta.mcmc and then the hpd interval function can be applied to the new object and that's going to return you uh, a 95%, so in this case, a 95% um, HPD interval, okay? And then they're gonna give you the lower and upper cutting points for that, okay? And, but I also just put in a 95% HPD interval from the previous code, so this code, the function, it's um, in, yeah, it's on, um, on Moodle, I posted over there. Um, and then per Tony's question from last time, that's what H is for. Um, but from now on, let's use CODA mostly because you notice that here, solve HPD and it's beta, right? It's only for beta. You have to write different functions for all of them, which I guess we probably don't, we shouldn't be worried about that. But this CODA function, the CODA package, as long as you can turn it into an MCMC project. So here, MCMC is the Markov chain Monte Carlo. We just call it in general. And then you can just use a generic HPD interval to come up with a particular 95% HPD interval instead of a function or like a distribution specific function that you have to write. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then this is the point that I was talking about earlier. The HPD intervals or regions actually are not invariant. So the way you can do it. So again, in order to come up with the HPD interval for the odds, Ratio. You're gonna load the uh, library packet, uh, load the CODA package again, and then you're just gonna convert the odds ratio into MCMC object, and then just apply the HPD interval again. But uh, you cannot just use what we um, we did before for the 95% central credible interval. That's invariant to monotonic transformation meaning that you can just apply the function on the two cutting point cutoff points and then do it however for HPD interval not invariant but in R it's pretty straightforward to do okay just like over here you create a new MCMC object and then use the HPD interval as the function to do that Okay, so this is a just demonstration. You see that if you do it, it's not the same. Okay, so I just put down a um, note in red over here. Okay, yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of this is about procedures and how you can do it. So I guess it might be a little bit boring just to show you how you can do, but once we, um, not, not today, but on Wednesday, once everybody brings their uh, brings your computer and then we can practice that will make much more sense but let me just also give you some other examples of why uh, multiple approximation can be useful so earlier we talked about for the theta in the beta distribution like for theta in the binomial um, because if we put a beta as the prior because controversy we come up with the beta posterior we know exactly what the posterior distribution is it probably doesn't make sense to do uh, multicolor approximation, but once you start caring about a function of it, which is like the odds ratio, that's what um, multicolor approximation can be useful. And here, that's a different situation. Suppose you actually have two samples, okay? And in this case, it's data from the VA hospitals. And for each year, they observed N patients and got a sample, or like a number of observations Y, which is the number of cases, which is real failures. And now I actually tell you, in two years, um, there are two sets of data over here. Okay, so Y1, so three, uh, 306 failures out of 651 for 1992, and then 300 failures out of 705 um, cases uh, in 1993. So now, instead of just looking them individually and compare, like just individually and think about within each year, if I want to compare the rate across the two years, then I might come up with a model saying that, okay, I'm now gonna assume two different independent binomial distributions, okay? One for 1992 and the other for 1993, okay? And then in this case, it will be much easier if we do the multiple approximation. Okay? So let me, let me just rephrase uh, the problem a little bit. So here we got data from the VA hospitals and we want to know the failure rates for two years. 
And in particular, we want to know the failure, the difference between the two failure rates from two years. Okay, so if you assume two independent binomial models, you can actually have a posterior for theta one, posterior for theta two, and if you do multicolor approximation, you can actually get the difference in a much simpler way. Because if you don't, you actually have to analytically derive what the distribution of the difference is. Okay, so let's let's um, uh, take a look at how you can do it. But before we move on to the next one, um, because now the question of interest is whether sec like the failure is probably going to change between these two years. Let's talk about the difference between two years, between pretty much theta one and theta two in this particular setup. Then if you actually going to start with independent uniform for two, um, for each of this binomial, then you're going to have independent posteriors. So for example, this will be your first posterior for theta one, theta two, your second posterior. And because you have independent prior, it's going to be independent um, posterior as well. So this is a very strong assumption. Again, you might want to challenge that, oh, I think the two years should be correlated or related in some way. I wouldn't think it's two independent binomial models. That's totally, um, I can, yeah, I cannot argue against that, but for now, uh, we're looking at a simple case that we're assuming they're independent and um, we're gonna do multicolor approximation. But of course, just like with the binomial data, with the Poisson data, you, can, you should always think about whether my assumption or your assumption um, are making sense and um, what are the places that might be questioned. Okay, so here, we're simplifying the situation. We're assuming that the two years are independent from each other. And we're just looking at whether they're probably going to change between the two years. That's the same as asking if there is a difference between the two thetas. So why is it that when you just call our samples rather than just taking the three known gaps and subtracting one from the other? Given that that would presumably give us, maybe we can't describe that curve in the known model, but it would give us a curve and we can still apply all those functions to find one mile. What do you mean by the curve, like the curve between, like, what is, what is the curve that we're talking about? Theta one? Well, so it's like you know, the data two condition LI and data one condition LI. We're modeling that using the other data model from theta. And we also just have, there are functions, right? They, they take, they're, they're taking input, mm -hmm. and they're taking input, and they're taking input. So we can mm -hmm. treat them like functions and just subtract one from the other, data, a curve that represents the difference, right? Right, okay. So here, okay. So here, uh, maybe I should say, okay, so here theta one is the beta, is the posterior, theta two o is the different beta, and here we're assuming they're independent. So Eli's question is, okay, they are, you can think of theta one, theta two as functions, and then you can just get the difference between them from the data. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, maybe let me just like rephrase that question and ask you, you all what you think. So if the first one is a beta, so let me just write very generically, beta A1, A2, A1, B1, and beta, oops, beta A2, B2. So Eli's question is, okay, here I have theta one, is one beta, theta two is in different beta, they're independent, can we treat them as two, I guess you're talking about two functions, and then based on the fact that both of them are two known betas, how can I get the difference directly? You're like, can we get the difference of the theta one, theta two directly from the two beta distributions? What do you think? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's two, I mean, there are so many different ways you can argue. I think Nick's point, in it, point is, okay, there are two separate beta distributions, okay? There are two proper distributions that they integrate to one. Like, if you're trying to get the, just the difference between these two, we don't even know what that is. So, I mean, you can imagine that it's a curve somewhere, but we don't even know what the curve will be. So let me actually bring my next slide, because I think I was trying to demonstrate um, that idea um, mathematically if we can. 
Okay, so if we define this to be the difference, and I use delta, d delta stands for difference, I just theta two minus theta one, and I'm interested in making inference about this delta, then actually, I mean, for the mean, the um, sample mean, I can return it, and you notice that it's gonna be slightly smaller than zero, okay? So that might be something, okay, is this significantly from zero? Okay, is it really negative? Because negative meaning that the failure probably increases, right? So that's okay. Possibility is doing a good job, but it's decreasing. Other cases actually start to ask, okay, if this whether this observed difference is real, okay, so significantly different from zero. So that will be a hypothesis I want to then make inference about. So here I just write down some things over here. Immediately, you can actually start doing the variance because they're independent, right? You might just add them up. And um, if you can have central limit theorem, I mean, this is really actually talking about um, um, the frequentist approach. If you're gonna have um, a central limit theorem, you can actually come up with a confidence interval over here and then try to see if zero is included. Unfortunately, zero is included, so okay. Can we really say that this is effective or not? So, what we should do, I mean, the real correct way to do it is try to come up this particular density. And that means we need to come up with theta two minus theta one given y. And this is the posterior of the difference. So the correct or rigorous formal way is actually to derive it step by step, okay? Um, but this is um, messy and hard to do. And if you're interested, you can actually go back because both of this are actually success, like a probability from between zero and one and both of them follow a beta distribution. You might be able to figure out something like analytically over there. Uh, but for the focus of, of our class, we actually gonna uh, focus on how to use the multicolor approximation and I guess you might already guess what you're gonna proceed, right? You can draw a bunch of theta one, you can draw a bunch of theta twos, and they're just one, like one to one corresponding, and you can just compute the difference. And then that distribution will be the distribution of the difference. Okay, so you see that Monte Carlo approximation um, can become very handy. So um, this is what you can do. So for each of this, you're drawing capital S, Values. We're gonna draw capital value, uh, capital uh, capital letter S values for theta one, the posterior, and also theta two. So this is so here. I'm using. I'm just demonstrating using different um, uh, size of S over here. Um, so you see that this is the data that we get. This is starting the approximation and drawing theta one. That's a beta distribution. I draw S of them, and these are the two hyperparameters if I'm doing a regular beta binomial, right? We have seen this before. And similarly, we did that for uh, theta two, and you're gonna get S draws as well. So here, you're gonna get vector of S draws up to of theta one. Here is a vector of S draws of theta two. And notice that all of the draws are independent from each other, okay? So we just like, because they're two vectors and they're independent from each other, like just within, both within and between of the two vectors. So we're just gonna take the difference between, between them one by one. So here we're gonna get a vector of S differences. They actually just summarize over there. So here, notice that instead of just like so i plot you can plot a histogram for example but because we're we want to answer the question of whether the probability actually decreased then because you have 5000 different draws of the differences you can actually return a rough probably over here that's i'm looking at how many of the differences is actually smaller than zero and i count how many over there using the sum. So he, this is a binary, okay? So this is gonna return you a bunch of false and true. 
and false gonna be coded as zero, true gonna be coded as one. So once you do this operation, it's gonna be a vector of 5,000 true or falses. And then if you do the sum, that's just gonna tell you how many trues are there, okay? So if you do sum, D smaller than zero, and then divided by the total number of draws you have done, you can see how many, or like what is the probability that you're actually gonna get a negative um, difference over there. Okay, and you can, based on this, you can make a statement that about, because this is very close to 95%, it's about a 95% posterior probability that delta is going to be smaller. Okay. So again, you can do this because, um, I mean, you can do this particular statement because you assume that the difference is a random quantity and you're coming up with now not an exact distribution, but now a bunch of draws. And those draws are going to approximate the two distribution even though that you don't know what it is but that can still help you to make inference about that unknown quantity okay so that hopefully all of this clears up that question okay sounds good all right um so the last one we only have about 10 minutes left um, but i would just start a little bit with the posterior predictive distributions and actually printed out some of the handouts, uh, like one handout that I posted on Moodle. So for Grant, uh, it's on Moodle uh, in the same um, section. For some exercise or some, you can think of this as a cheat to work for Yeah, so maybe like for the rest of today, let's just focus on the handout because I think once I start, the next one will be like a, too much, um, we won't be able to finish, but the handout uh, provides more of um, a general overview of what is predictive distribution and what they're doing for us. Okay, um, okay so maybe like spend like two minutes just read through the document really quick. I'll bring a whiteboard over here so we can start talking about um, the parts one by one. And we'll do some demonstration on the board. Okay, so um, I just, so for the handout, you notice that in addition to posterior predictive, I also mentioned a little bit about the prior predictions. 
Okay, so let's maybe like just take a step um, back just to think about what is like what does predictive mean or why we care about predictive. Okay. So I think last time we talked about because uh, in the beta binomial phase we actually were deriving what a predictive distribution for a new unobserved um, data point would like would be like right. So at that time we were thinking about for the television example. We know that for this particular sample, we got a posterior um, distribution for the theta, which is the success probability of having a TV. So if now you want to make a prediction of somebody new, say like this, the person or the household or the teenager will still be from the same population. So that means like the theta will be the same one. And now I want to make a prediction as whether this teenager is going to have a TV at home or not. Okay, so that will be a um, like a example or like a situation where you want to make a prediction. And maybe for this case, it might not be as appealing as other cases, as especially for finances. People like to make predictions of like stock prices for the next day, for the next few days, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are a lot of um, like the uses of predictive distributions are. We are not only interested in how to make inference about a particular parameter in the model. Uh, we want to make use of it, right? We want to make use of it, and one way to use it, or like one application, will be how to do prediction. So in the Bayesian methods, there are two schools, uh, but gradually like one overtook the other. So the first one is the prior predictive, and the second one is the posterior predictive. Okay, and you notice that. Like if you have done the reading for the lecture or for this chapter, and as we go on, you notice that we always just do the posterior predictive, okay? And um, so let me just explain maybe the two, um, the difference between these two, and then maybe um, we all can have a short discussion about which one you think makes more sense. And so for prior predictive, from the name, how do we guess that we're making prediction based on the prior distribution? Um, prior distribution represents a personal belief or whatever you have known before, and that's not integrating with the data. Okay, so that will be uh, like a remark people like to make when they do not want to or they do not agree using prior predictive distribution. Because even though you're making predictive distribution, like you're making predictions, you're only based on your prior belief, you're not combining the data, you're not utilizing all of the information. Okay. Uh, so posterior predictive is just from the name, you notice that you're making prediction based on posterior distribution. And the example that we have seen before, so on the top of the screen right now, I wrote uh, what we did last time. So with the beta binomial. But remember, like we're trying to derive what the predictive distribution for a new observation will be so we were uh, like trying to integrate out like first of all rewrite uh, what the joint distribution is and then integrating out the unknown parameter okay and in the end we realize that it's a binomial again but newly in particular if you're making prediction for one and that will give you a new success updated success probability for um, y tilde equals to one okay so that's um, posterior predictive uh, if you think about how you're using the information, because you're making prediction based on the posterior, you're utilizing what you've learned prior, and also what the data tells you. That you okay, and gradually, um, I think this two, like, I wouldn't even say schools, my two ways of thinking, two ways of doing things, um, I think they started around the same time, because prediction is an important topic in stats in general, and then in Bayesian uh, analysis as well. So. Early on, people uh, were figuring out how we can do predictions. So there was this prior predictive and posterior predictive, and gradually posterior predictive became the norm, and now everybody's doing pre uh, posterior predictive. Um, so earlier, like just now, I just talked about like maybe usually what people think of um, the drawbacks of the prior because that's not taking care, of, like not, that's not considering the data, while the posterior can can. And um, yeah, I just want to know what do you think? Do you agree with that? statement or do you see any um any other arguments that you can make either supporting the prior or supporting the posterior or or any other way
Let me let me write down prior is um, prior information. Or maybe I can ask, in what situation you think prior predictive can be useful? What is prior predictive using? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be one situation that you can, right? And also, like, sometimes you might be wondering, oh, whether, like, the prior distribution that I'm putting on is sensible. So you can actually generate data from which is doing prediction, you generate y tilde from the prior distribution to see how the shape looks like. Because say, for, for example, we learn, I guess, a lot about the beta distribution already, but still, like the two parameters, like the a and b, I mean, I personally still don't have a really, like, like feelings about how I can change these values. So sometimes I'm going to plot, say, what a beta distribution looks like. And then maybe uh, another way that I can do it is instead of plotting the beta, I can plot the, predict the prior predictive like the y from the from the beta prior that I can do and then look at what the data tells me based on the prior. In that sense, I can get a more direct sense, I guess, as whether the prior is making sense or not. Okay, so that would be um, another, another area that prior predictor um, uh, can be useful. And one more thing before we end, um, I need to think about that argument a little bit more. Uh, but I definitely heard about a uh, comment saying that the reason why you shouldn't use the posterior predictive is that you're using the data multiple times. Okay, so think about how you're going to do the posterior predictive. You're going to come up like a theta, say in this case, theta, given the data, right? And you come up with the posterior distribution for theta, and then you're going to make draws based on this. Okay, so there is an argument saying that you actually, if you're doing posterior predictive, your data is interfering too much in terms of the inference. And I would just like post it over here. I think after class, I will post that on Moodle as well as a discussion topic. And on Wednesday, we're gonna come back, uh, finishing talking about this handout. So you notice that this handout, just break it down. I just add in like a few examples that we actually have seen already just to complete the picture of what predictions are doing. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna spend maybe about 20 minutes of how like predictive distributions can be done using multiple approximation. And then uh, please also bring your laptop on Wednesday so you can do some hands-on uh, practice using that, okay?